Welcome everyone to AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday, part of AURI Connects monthly online series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. I'm Dan Scogan, the AURI Director of Government and Industry Relations and your host on Webinar Wednesdays. The AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute in Minnesota. This program aims to actively engage all participants in the food and egg industry to improve competitiveness of producers, businesses, and entrepreneurs through ongoing purposeful connection of resources and partners along the value chain and increase knowledge of opportunities, technologies, and trends. Remember, this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at auri.org. Remember that you will be muted during our presentations but you can send us questions. Your written questions can come through the Q&A portal on your screen. Today, we welcome AURI team members, senior scientist Alan Daring and engineer Riley Gordon from the AURI Co-Products Lab in Wasika. Al Daring began his tenure as senior scientist for the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute, or AURI, over 15 years ago. In this position, he's in charge of managing client projects and the Co-Products pilot plant collecting and reporting on data related to applied research and product development, and presenting AURI's project initiatives at industry conferences and tours. Riley Gordon graduated with honors from Brandon University with a Bachelor of Science degree in physics in the spring of 2014. Then in 2017, he completed a degree program at the University of Minnesota, obtaining a bachelor's degree in civil engineering with environmental emphasis in water-related topics. Coinciding with his time at the U of M, Riley also interned with a civil engineering consulting firm, working in both intelligent transportation systems and water resources groups. Al Daring and Riley Gordon, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Well, thank you, Dan. And I wanna thank everyone for participating today. Um, one of the goals here is that we hope you will find value in our presentation and uh, you know, if you're able to identify some areas that we can provide assistance, boy, feel free to reach out to us. Another note here, this is more of a note of caution. You know, when you hear the word pilot lab, if you're expecting white coats and test tubes, that is not what we do. AURI does have an analytical lab, but today we're gonna to focus on the pilot lab um, that's located in Waseca, Minnesota and uh, the services that we can provide through that lab. And then uh, one, last, one last note, um, I do realize for parts of you that are around the central time zone, this may be your lunch hour. If you are watching over your lunch hour, just, just a word of caution that we may be talking about manure and fish waste. So we don't mean to ruin your lunch, but it kind of gives you an idea of some of the topics we deal with. Um, before we begin, I wanted to point out, for those of you not familiar with AURI, what the AURI Co-Product Pilot Lab is about. And you can see our mission statement is there. We seek utilization ideas for plant and animal byproducts or co-products that present environmental and economic opportunities. So our role here is focused around agriculture, either advancing processes that utilize agriculture or commodities, or finding new ways to utilize those materials. And then uh, secondly, you know, I won't go through the pilot lab capabilities, but you can read it on your screen. We hope to touch on all of those as we go through the presentation here at noon. So Riley, next screen. So I wanted to share with you some of the team that we have in Waseca and, and within AURI that supports our, our work here. Um, Abella Takesta, he's been with us for nearly eight years, one of our associate scientists, great background in uh, agriculture, food. Riley Gordon, we all heard Riley's introduction. Riley's just been a fabulous resource for us down here and his engineering background. And then myself, who's been around for 20, going on 21 years now at AURI. And this is, it's been, it's been fun every, I get to seriously say this every day that it is interesting because the number of projects we continue to see in the variety um, keep life interesting. 
Next slide. The other individuals that play a, a big role in not just the co-product pilot lab, but AURI in general, is uh, Harold Stanislawski. He's our business development director. Harold has a wide background in years of business development because that is key when we're working with companies that are either entrepreneurs or startups, having that business development side. Um, the other one is Michael Sparby. Michael's been here for over 20 years. He's a commercialization director. And what I always say about Michael is, um, I think he knows about every industry in Minnesota related to agriculture. So when you reach out to you or I for a potential project, it'll probably be one of those two individuals that you connect with or feel free to connect with any of us in the lab. Dr. Michael Studeberg, he is our scientist. He's actually based out of Marshall, Minnesota. Um, we sent a lot of samples to Michael's direction. Uh, Michael's our analytical chemist and he has a, a set of support staff with him. And then the senior director of science and technology over not only the co-product group, but the food, the bio-based re renewable energy group is Rod Larkins. So um, those may be people you connect with in the near future here. Next slide. So just to quickly highlight the areas of service that we work in. Number one, we focus on applied research and oftentimes People wonder, well, what's the difference between what you do and what the university, of, what universities do? Oftentimes, universities focus on basic research, so they'll prove a concept. They'll conduct feed trials. They'll conduct field research. They'll prove methods. Our job is really taking this proven technology, moving it forward, and helping to commercialize it. So that's that's our focus is the applied. The other area we provide assistance in is with technical assistance, not only developing a new product, but helping with formulation, help with troubleshooting a process. And that's where Riley comes in and plays a key role on the engineering side. And then I mentioned commercialization. Um, Harold Stanislawski and Michael Sparby obviously play a big role in that area. And then the last one I want to touch on is our innovation networking. Nan Larson leads that group up. And uh, one example of that is, well, these webinars, but then we also have industry thought leaders that we put together. These are a group of industry leaders specifically focused on a, a topic. And uh, one that we have going on now, it focuses on food waste. Another, another one that we have on the, um, renewable energy side is around anaerobic digestion. So we'll bring these groups of individuals together to share ideas, share needs, share concerns, which is uh, very informative and it helps move that industry forward. Next slide, Riley. And then uh, lastly, the areas that we provide assistance to, there's four of them, which you see on the screen. The first one is bio-based bio-based products. Um, and I want to back up, even though our focus today is on the equipment and the services that we can provide in the co-product pilot lab, you'll see how the services that we can provide actually support all four of these areas. And they include bio-based products and materials, co-products, which is basically I like to describe what a co-product is, and, and oftentimes I use the ethanol industry. So in the ethanol industry, you take you have the corn, which is the primary feedstock to make ethanol. So that is your goal to make ethanol. But a, a perfect example of a co-product from the ethanol industry is dry distiller grains, which is a high protein, high energy byproduct used for livestock and poultry feeds. That's usually what a co-product consists of, and it can be everything from a milk processing waste to uh, fish waste, manures, compost, you name it. The third area is food. AURI is getting into the, the food realm um, quite rapidly, and Riley's going to touch on this as we, we're expanding, and we recently put in a, a food, an inspected food grade facility to do some food processing work. And the last one is renewable energy. 
a lot of work with the biomass pellet fuels, anaerobic digestion, which I touched on earlier, and the list goes on. So Riley, next slide. So today, the focus areas that we're going to highlight over the next half hour will be um, our food grade pilot lab. Riley's going to give you an update on that. And then within those facilities, some of the services we have to offer, such as cold oil pressing and filtering, um, seed cleaning, fiber decortication, which, is, which was a new addition for us two years ago. And we finally got it ramped up and going last year. We have a wide array of milling technologies that Riley's going to share. And then I'll touch on some of the drying and dewatering capabilities that we have. Uh, the densification uh, equipment that we have. And then lastly, we're working through collaboration with another company where we are actually housing some anaerobic digestion work. So it'll be fun sharing that with you. So Riley, if you want to take it away, I'll hand it over. All right. Thanks, Al. Yeah, great background on some of the work that we do um, outside the lab and, and touching into the lab. So I'll just jump right in now to our lab spaces, um, wanted to touch first on our expansion over at uh, a building in Wasika, just a couple blocks away from our primary location. When I joined the organization almost four years ago now, um, we were uh, really starting to hurt for space in our primary location where we had about, just about a thousand square foot of some equipment that Al will go uh, over in a little bit. Um, but basically over the last Few years we've been uh, expanding over at this Clear Lake Press facility, um, and this is just uh, you know a snapshot without being able to either you know take everyone in there and show you what it looks like or even video. Um, this is just kind of a snapshot of our layout over there and just kind of a timeline of when we've had uh, things commissioned. So we got a fluid bed dryer, dewatering press, uh, decorticator, as Al mentioned. Um, we're doing a lot of work with Kernza. I'll get into a little bit of uh, the details of all the work that we're doing with Kernza over a couple LCC MAR grants. And then just as of recently, we added a food grade room, uh, which is gonna house um, oil pressing and seed cleaning for us uh, moving forward. But this is uh, kind of our, a look of our layout as it is today. Uh, pretty proud of where we've come in the last couple of years, um, getting a lot of these pieces of equipment um, up and running. So first, wanted to chat a little bit about our food grade lab. So this was just recently commissioned um, just this year. We got it inspected in March um, by the MDA. So we're fully food inspected and ready to go. We can uh, produce food grade product for clients. This uh, is going to allow us to kind of expand our area and touch on clients um, that we couldn't uh, in the past. Basically, we've had an oil press in the lab for uh, about five or six years now, but we've only been able to use that for product R&D. So now we can have, um, or basically uh, use it for process R&D, but not actually allow the uh, clients to utilize that product at the end of the day, which is uh, kind of an industry gap we found at this kind of smaller scale. Um, so we're looking forward to being able to uh, provide that filtered cold pressed oil. Um, and then the pieces of equipment you see there are uh, uh, impact hauler and an indent separator, uh, which will be able to support both the hemp industry and uh, actually was funded under a Kernza grant um, where we uh, uh, have a process to clean and dehull Kernza from the field. Um, so that's a little bit of a close up of those equipments. An indent separator is um, anyone in the green cleaning industry knows it's just uh, it's a big uh, drum that rotates and it's got indents on the on that drum that separates uh, material based on length. So as a sifter separates based on width or an oblong screen separates on width, uh, the, the indent actually separates on length and it turns out for things like hemp and Kernza, uh, that, that works out really well. Um, and an impact hauler essentially is a spinning uh, wheel that throws a piece of grain uh, or grain against the impact surface and busts off that outer husk, whether it's a sunflower seed, a hemp seed, a Kernza seed, um, it's, it's a way of getting that husk off the outer edge for, uh, for a product that would hit the market. Uh, so this is just some, some close-ups of us running Kernza. So Kernza is a new, uh, it's, it's a new cro cover crop that's being worked on at the University of Minnesota um, and uh, is being commercialized by the Land Institute um, and, and other organizations. Um, what it is, is a 
technically it's an intermediate wheat grass, so it's a cross between wheat and uh, grass and has properties very similar to wheat. Um, we're working with a number of different breweries and bakeries and restaurants getting uh, Queen Bee Whole Grain in their hands out of our uh, food grade room. And so um, basically using it as a malted grain and beer um, or, or milling it into a flour for things like cookies and um, cakes and uh, pasta, tortillas, those types of things. So what this is it just feeding through the indent after going through an impact holer. Um, basically separating it, separating the stuff that comes out of the hole in the, in the impact holer from the stuff that didn't get uh, deholed, which would be recycled back through the holer. And then we use an aspirator, which we have on site to separate those holes that break off. Um, and that's essentially the process. Um, we're going to be, or we have been um, cleaning other seeds as well at our uh, pilot facility. So this is actually pictures from our primary facility. Um, and we're cleaning, doing cleaning of pennycress and camelina, which are other crops that are under the uh, Forever Green initiative at the University of Minnesota, including the Kernza as well. So we've been able to uh, use, utilize our aspirators, shaker tables, um, and those new pieces of equipment to do cleaning for um, all of these seeds, um, getting, getting small quantities in the hands of researchers and product development people to, uh, to test the the products in, in uh, different food products on the shelves. And then uh, getting into our oil pressing. Um, so this is a capability that we've had, like I said, for five or six years, um, able to, with Camelina and Pennycrest, those are ones that we run a lot through here. Um, seeds that contain oil, it's basically a spinning screw in a chamber that expels oil from the seed um, without any added heat. So there's a little bit of added heat at the start of it um, that we press a button and it and it heats up the the shaft but then uh, once the process starts there's no added heat it's all just the the friction uh, from the seed rubbing against the inside of the chamber that is any of the heat and so it stays under 130 140 is kind of the definition of a cold press um, so that oil comes off as like a, a crude oil and then we're able to in the bottom right of your screen there we have a filter uh, that's it's a pressurized ve uh, vessel filter from Kerncraft where it uh, pushes the oil through two filter plates um, and we're able to further clean that oil of any particulate matter or any seed matter that comes through in the oil press and then uh, we add things such as activated charcoal and bleaching clays and things of that nature where we can further purify that oil and um, end up with really clean oil for clients and again we've previously just been doing this as a process development piece and kind of showcasing what these pieces of equipment can do and um, and that kind of thing. But now we're excited to be able to actually uh, provide clients with clean uh, filtered oil that can be actually used in food products um, for, for development and for tasting um, in, a, in that new lab that I had, uh, mentioned earlier. So that's exciting. Um, and then moving on to our fiber decortication that Al had uh, mentioned before. Uh, so this is a piece of equipment that was originally manufactured in the Czech Republic. Um, it was it was purchased by the Composites Innovation Center in Canada in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, and uh, upon a visit there um, a few years back, uh, they were they had were in a place where they were losing funding in their hemp program, and so we're looking to get rid of this decorticator. And so we thought it was a great opportunity to have um, to be able to uh, have a small scale decorticator just to kind of showcase what decortication is and what it isn't to several groups. There's a lot of growing interest in hemp fiber. The hemp grain market's pretty pretty established. CBD was a big boom for a couple of years, but now we're seeing lots of interest in the fiber space. So I think that this is a, a great piece of equipment that just kind of, a, it, it was bought as kind of an educational tool, but also to be able to provide small amounts of hemp fiber and herd um, to groups that are doing product R&D. So if you're not familiar with a hemp stalk, it's made of about 70 to 80% uh, hemp herd, which is like the inner woody core. Um, when it goes through processing, I would I would uh, liken it to like an absorbent wood chip. Um, and then the other 20 to 30% of the, the plant is an outer bass fiber um, that can be used in insulation and non-wovens, but also can be taken to textiles and, and biocomposites as well. Um, lots of uses for hemp fiber. A lot of people talk about all the different uses of hemp and a lot of that is actually within the fiber and the herd. Um, so this is again, just a series of basically pickers and openers. So the openers, um, 
uh, or sorry, calendars and openers. So the pit, there's pickers that basically without a video, it's tough to explain, but they're pick, there's a needle flat conveyor that moves and uh, pickers from up above that open the individual fibers after they've been passed through two heavy duty rollers, which work to crush or clean. When, and when I say clean, I just mean the herd falling from the, from the actual fiber portion. Um, so this is a, uh, just a great tool. It's been uh, a lot of people have come in, even despite COVID, we have, you know, people in just kind of social distancing and just looking at the machine, a lot of interest in, in seeing it and, and some of the materials that are coming out. We have grant projects lined up with it, um, with MinDOT actually to look at uh, leveraging this piece of equipment to replace uh, hemp fiber for plastic components and, and imported natural fibers and erosion control project products such as blankets and sediment control logs. Uh, we're excited about that and uh, some other opportunities that are coming up as well, uh, but could talk, talk about hemp for a long time. Here's just a, a couple of pictures of what we have. So on the left there, that's a nice uh, redded. So it's like a controlled rotting that happens in the field to the stock. So really nice separation we get on, on a redded stock. And on the right, you can kind of see um, these, these materials are a little bit less rutted, a little bit more golden uh, color is a big indicator of that. Um, when we, we find if it's been less rutted, it's uh, definitely less easily separated on that piece of machinery. Um, so working with different, different growers and producers of the bales and kind of um, working with on that side of it as well to kind of see how rutting affects the, the processability of, of these materials and then looking at end specs of them as well as something that we're focused on. Um, and then you can see there's a couple of fractions of herd that we were able to get pretty clean, 90 to 95% clean of fiber um, through uh, just our shaker table and aspirator. Again, a piece of equipment that were mentioned previously. So uh, that's kind of our, our work in fiber and it continues. And I'm excited to um, keep moving along with that, potentially getting some carting uh, equipment and um, expanding, even expanding further kind of the reach of, of where we can go with the materials that we're able to produce with that. Uh, lastly, before I pass it back to Al, just going to touch on milling. Uh, so our milling capabilities include uh, most notably this Champion Hammer Mill. It's a 25 uh, horsepower hammer mill that we, uh, on the left picture there, you can see there's two places that we can uh, put screens in. So we have a number of different screens that we're able to basically reduce the size of particles of, of any material. And a lot of times that this is like kind of the first process when a material or a toad of material comes into our lab. Um, we put it, we process it through the hammer mill in order to get the particle size um, to a, either um, just to a desirable particle size for uh, pelleting, because when you pellet, you have to have the material uh, has to be uh, shorter in, in length than the diameter of a pellet. Uh, so I'll talk quite a bit about our pelleting. We got a lot of projects with that, but a lot of times um, this is the first, first step in that. And sometimes we just do milling and sifting for groups as well, and it just ends there. Uh, so there's a lot of different variety of projects that come in. You see corn cobs. I think that is rolling up our conveyor there into the hammer mill. Um, and then uh, these are a couple other mills that we have. We have a burr mill that we've done some hemp hops processing with. Uh, the Urschel Comatrol um, is another one, which is like a cutting mill. Uh, you can kind of see just the screen of it there. Um, and then a small scale retch cutting mill, which is very similar to like a small scale hammer mill with screens. Um, and then we have sifting capabilities. We have a Midwestern sieve or a Suico type sieve that's on a larger scale. And then we have some tabletop air jet sieves and vibratory sieves to do particle size analysis. And um, we're gonna actually look at doing protein concentration in our food grade lab from the meals from the oil seed press as well, where we'd mill, sift the meal and the, the minuses of that process uh, is a, a, essentially a protein concentrate. Uh, so that is what I had. So I'm going to pass it over to Al for uh, some talk on dewatering. Well, thank you, Riley. And yeah, we thought it was important to highlight the sieving capabilities because whenever we look at particle size, having different sieving capabilities is a must. Now, dewatering, this is always a, a favorite topic of ours down here because as we mentioned early on, our focus is with co products. And so many times to move the value of a co-product, it involves, can we efficiently remove the water? Because a lot of these uh, byproducts or co-products are, are oftentimes wet. 
They have high either nutrient content or energy content for a food or for a livestock or poultry feed or as a fertilizer, but we have to get rid of the water for storage. So that is, that is a big focus of ours. Uh, next, next slide, Riley. So the one, one that I always like to point out, and I, I like to use this slide be, mainly because of the visual, but there's two ways we can dewater equipment. Number one, it's either thermal using heat or it's mechanical. So I always like this picture here. You can see the flame or I use a scenario or is, is it more efficient to just like wring out a sponge, put force on a sponge to, to drain the water. And um, what we have seen and what is known is you can remove water much more efficiently mechanically before you, you use thermal drying. And uh, when we do compare various drying technologies, you know, we always use 970 BTUs to evaporate a pound of moisture as our guideline, you know, and then we'll compare different uh, technologies because some, some may be as efficient as 12, 1300 BTUs to evaporate a pound of moisture. We've seen that all the way up to 2900, which is quite a bit less e efficient. But if we can do it mechanically first, that's usually the direction we'll go. Riley, next slide. So what do we have in our lab to accomplish this? Number one, I want to point out on a lot of these pieces of equipment, if we do not have these or do not own these pieces of equipment, we do work with a variety of companies that will bring equipment in, we can demo their equipment, showcase it off to clients for a specific application. So always keep that in mind. Well, one of the things we do have here, we recently purchased, we were using a dewatering press from a, a different facility, but we recently purchased the, um, the uh, Vincent press. And this one is a CP4 because it actually has a four inch shaft going through it. And it, you can just see it has the mesh screen to maintain the cake or the meal, but yet under pressure, the moisture can be driven off of that. And we'll see a 30, 40, 50% reduction in moisture on materials. But again, that's based on the material, how much of that moisture is bound. And then I just threw in a couple photos of some really high moisture alfalfa down on the right, bottom right of your screen. We're doing some research looking at adding value to alfalfa juice once it's extracted. High in nutrients, um, high in sugar content. So that's one example of using the press. So I'll give you an idea of those capabilities. Next slide, Riley. And then after we remove the water from pressing, if, if that's an option, we, did we do have a new dryer. We we purchased this caisson dryer. As you can see, it's not a commercial scale. We had a much larger fluid bed dryer that we were using. But one of the issues we run into with the fluid bed was the size that it was. It was very hard for us to give information back to the clients focused on how much energy is required to dry a certain, certain material how much uh, heat is required, how fast can you dry that piece of material. And that's where this caisson dryer has just been very valuable for, for in our new facility that Riley pointed out. What we can do on this, we have, we have a, a fluke meter that can be attached to it. So we can, this one, the dryer that we have runs off of electricity. But with that fluke instrument, we can calculate the energy usage for not only running the, uh, the fans and the motors, but also for the heating element. And then we can convert that to BTUs per pound. So if a client is using propane, natural gas, coal, biomass, um, it's a way to you know, predict how a material is going to dry and the amount of fuel they're gonna consume doing that. And then we just threw on some charts that, that we've provided to clients that give them an idea of Number one, the, the speed and the rate of drying and how temperature affects that. Um, all good information as they build their, uh, 
feasibility as they build a feasibility study around the pro a product or a process. So next slide. Then as Riley pointed out, the pellet mill. Um, we've we've had this for years, and uh, I always joke that you think you've seen about as many products as there can be to be pelleted, and the products just keep coming. I do know pelleting wool, pelleting rubber. Um, there are a few products, don't even attempt it, but uh, we've been successful at working with just a number of companies utilizing our pellet mill to number one, develop a new product, um, aid with, a, with their process if they want to expand. And what we did is we did have a smaller pellet mill years ago and about eight to 10 years ago, we upgraded we have a 60 horsepower California pellet mill. It's an 1112-4. So we're using a 12 inch diameter ring die, not a flat die, um, that has a four inch wide face on it. The nice thing about this pellet mill is it can be scaled up uh, very easily to, to predict what a 150 horse pellet mill would do. And we've even done some work with groups that have three, 400 horse pellet mills. And it's been very accurate. With this piece of equipment, we're also capable of adding steam in the conditioner. Um, we have, we have a, a conditioning unit on there, but then we can also inject molasses and other materials as needed. What I don't have on this table is, you know, you can see the pelleting cooler that we have where the conveyor is going to the end. But on smaller runs too, we have a shaker table. So when the pellets come off, we can run the run run it over a shaker table, remove the fines. So I mean, there's there's all kinds of methods we can use. Next slide, Riley. And then to support that densification uh, equipment and the capabilities, um, I wanted to throw a few things in here. On the top left slide, you will see that's where the steam comes into the conditioner. So I pointed out we do have steam capabilities, which add to efficiency, add to pellet quality, extended dye wear. I mean, we could go on and on the value of steam. Just over from that to the right on the top, you'll see a CPM crumbler. Um, actually, it's a roller mill. We can change the sieves and the shiv speed to make it act like a crumbler. So on projects where we're helping them to develop a granulated fertilizer, what needs to be done first is you pull out the material. Secondly, you run it through the granulator. And then right below that, you'll see we have a Midwestern sieve where we can actually size the particles, whether it's for a granulated fertilizer or, you know, we've also done that for various feed products, to you name it. Um, in the upper right where the red circle is around an air atomizing nozzle, it's to highlight we do have atomization. So if you want to atomize water, oil, molasses, or a product into the conditioner on a product before it is pelleted, we definitely have that capability and we use that periodically. Uh, some groups don't use steam at all. They just use water. So here's where we typically inject it. Uh, the top right photo is just a, a photo of our setup where we're doing large runs going right to the cooler. And normally you'd have a tote placed under that cooler. Bottom left, it, it gives you a snapshot of the dies that we're using. This machine could hold a 16 inch die, but because we're a research lab and we do have to lift these dies once in a while, um, we stuck with the 12 inch. And then we also do a uh, pellet durability testing, pellet crush testing. We have a lot of auxiliary equipment to support, support those efforts. So next slide, Riley. And then I did want to touch on, I had mentioned that CPM mill was a ring die mill. So the material flows into it and the, die, the rollers are stationary and the die is the one turning in circles. On this flat die mill that we have, it's a 30 horsepower flat die mill. In this situation, the die is actually laying flat or horizontal, just as the name implies. And the material is fed on the top and the rollers are turning, pressing the material down through the holes or the inlet on the die. So you are using some, some gravity 
to assist you. And then there's just a few uh, photos of, of the pellets coming out. Actually, the bottom left is the pellets going over the shaker table to remove any fines. So that's another capability that we have. Riley, next photo. And then the last one I wanted to touch on is a, a new effort that AURI has been involved with. We were actually collaborating with, with a group that, that brought to us anaerobic digester capabilities. So this, the top left is a photo of our uh, Clear Lake facility and the anaerobic digesters, there's 2000 gallon digestion tanks, which you'll see on the right, you actually see one tank, um, but they are sitting within this trailer. You enter the trailer, the top left picture, um, we can, when we want to test various feedstocks, what you're seeing there is actually a, a holding tank that has a macerating pump in it. So we'll just fork material over to it, discharge it into that tank, and then they do the research on the gas capability, looking basically at two things, the, the quantity or volume of gas production coming out, and then they can also look at the quantity or the quality what type of gas are we looking at? Are we looking at methane and, and various products? So look forward to this venture and collaboration with them. And I know we, we, we have a lot of groups that have various co-products where as you look at the value chain, you know, number one, you know, upcycling the food is number one, but generally next it's going to a feed or poultry market. Then you come down to fertilizer, compost, and then um, I think one of the greatest opportunities that exists for many of these wet uh, biomass feedstocks or co-products will be digestion and recovering the gas. So we look forward to where this will go. Riley, next slide. So I wanted to wrap it up. And uh, number one, thank you for taking the time out of your day here at noon or wherever you're listening from to join us. You know, we look forward to supporting you with your value-added agricultural project. Um, what, what I really wanted to do today was highlight what our capabilities are. We didn't touch on specific projects themselves um, because some of them are covered by NDAs, some are confidential, some we can share. But boy, if, if there's a way that AURI can support any of the effort or any, any of the process development work that you're doing or even product development work you're doing. That's why people generally knock on our door and we'll see if we can help you. So thank you again. Riley, did I miss anything? All right. All right. Thanks, Riley. Thanks, Al. Time for you to ask your questions. We've got a couple of experts from the EURI Co-Products Lab uh, with us this afternoon. So if you have uh, questions on some of these slides or uh, uh, processes that they were talking about. Uh, use your Q&A portal now to uh, answer or ask your questions. We'll get them uh, uh, to our guests. And, and Al, I might just start, uh, it, it intrigues some, I think, uh, uh, that you had a food grade lab now in the co-products lab. So what's happening, what can happen in that lab that couldn't or wasn't happening in the uh, food lab over in Marshall? Great question, Dan. Well, number one, the food grade lab is new. Um, as Riley pointed out, you know, we've had the cold oil press for quite some time already. And we were getting, and it's just where equipment is housed at, Dan. You know, in Marshall, we have a sensory lab and, and they work with uh, food label development assistance. In the pilot lab is where we actually do oil extraction um, to separate the oil from the cake. And we wanted to keep that service in this lab just because of the space that we had. And many of the requests that were coming in was for oil that could be used in uh, human trials, taste testing, sensory panels. Well, obviously we could not produce that material in, in the lab that we do all these other processes in. So uh, Riley took it upon himself and Abel to, uh, identify what was required to, to construct a food grade inspected lab, and we went forward with it. So what's nice now is when we get requests from uh, larger companies for uh, say canola oil or pennycrest oil, some of these new oils, 
we can actually produce it in a food grade facility, filter it in a food grade facility, and they can utilize it for their, uh, for their uh, product development. Do you have a reactor for high pressure reaction or extraction of biomass with solvents and or acid uh, catalysts? That we do not. And um, when, we have, when we've run into projects where we're utilizing biomasses that have been reacted, um, either with a catalyst or through pressure, we've used, usually collaborated with different groups to produce those materials. And just as a side note, um, you saw that digester, you know, that I talked about. Um, some of the material that's actually being evaluated in that digester is biomass that's gone through a high pressure reaction to break down that lignin and cellulose. But AURI on site does not. I just I think, add, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to just add to that. So, um, when you think about CBD, for example, I don't know if the question asker was thinking about that, but that goes in through an extraction process, uh, the flower does, and then after that flower, that, that leftover biomass is a great example of a co-product, and we've seen a lot of projects um, with adding value to that material, looking at the feed value, the fuel value, the fertilizer value. Uh, really, it highs, lies highest in the feed opportunity, lots of pelleting projects, both pre and post extraction, actually, of that flower material for CBD uh, to one on the front end, increase the efficiency of your of your extraction and on the back end, just to make a feed pellet. Um, so that's kind of how we've touched on that, but um, don't actually have the capability to do solvent extraction in house, as Al said. Well, and I think it, it points to the fact that you uh, you do have networks and AURI has networks and when capabilities aren't uh, available to us or to AURI, you have people that you can go to. You're correct, Dan, and I, I wish I could say we did have those capabilities, but eventually you either run out of people to operate it or space. And, and we're not here to compete with uh, equipment providers. So a lot of times we'll help develop a product or a process, but then when it goes, when they move forward to uh, getting bids on equipment, you know, obviously they're working directly with the vendors. And one of the other things I wanted to know quick, I was going to do this in the presentation, Dan, you know, on the pellet mills, one example, uh, we see a lot of projects come in because, because of the size of our pellet mill, uh, people would rather have us plug our 12 inch pellet dies or break our, our 12 inch dies that are maybe $3,000, 3,500 instead of breaking their $15,000 pellet die. So that, that is one of the services we provide. Hopefully it doesn't happen. <laughs> but occasionally it does. It has. <laughs> Let's talk about, uh, processes in general, uh, if I, if I hear you right, anytime there's a process, there's a co-product. And people just have to get wrap their head around the fact that there may be value in there. And I could go on, Dan, on examples. And Riley, jump in if, if you want, or should I just start on that one? Go ahead. You are. And, and Dan, I always joke that, you know, to most, it's a waste product until they meet AURI. And, and that's just a joke, but our focus here, we've, we've seen so many different byproducts, co-products. Our job here is to number one, characterize that co-product when it comes in. Oftentimes the client has done that or they want us, want our assistance to do it. You know, what is the nutrient value of, you know, that the co-product contains, but everything we work with here is with the co-product. And, and some examples of that, I mentioned at the start of this presentation, fish waste, you know, you, once you collect the, the, the meat and the, the stuff of value, we often get what's left, but believe me, there's a lot of value in what's left. If you can uh, change that to a stable state where it can be used as a foliar feeding or a fertilizer for plant growth, that's ideal. Um, some other ones is you know, dry distiller grains years ago, that was a big one that we worked with. And another one that always seems to appear, and it's one that people could understand pretty easily, is with biodiesel. When you produce biodiesel, one of the main byproducts is glycerol or glycerin. You know, and it's not always in the pure form like you see in your shampoos, your toothpaste, your soap, and there's a lot of it. It's how do you add value to it? 
but almost everything we work with is is a co-product or or at times a commodity. Anything to add to that, Riley? Yeah, the way I guess I just add quickly is just the way I look at it is the co-product. A co-product is a byproduct that has value added to it or has value. So I would just say it's a, it's a byproduct till it gets to the doors of AURI and then it leaves a co-product. <laughs> Al, over 20 years at AURI in the co-products lab, uh, has a client come to you uh, looking for something and you've actually found something else of value that you really weren't expecting going in? Dan, you're putting me on the spot here. Don't want to do that. Generally, I, I have to say, you know, when the client comes in with an idea or a vision that is the direction we pursue, and I'm, I'm sure that's happened. I just can't think of anything offhand. It'd be a good story though. Uh, typically, how much product do you need to, uh, to go through the lab? Yep, so that was a key thing. And it was on the, on the first slide with our mission statement. You know, we're pretty flexible here. One of the minimum, I mean, we can work with product down to 25 or 50 pounds. When you look at characterizing a product or, or just doing a sieve analysis or even a small drying trial. Once we get up to milling, pelleting, processing, you almost need to, here's a perfect example. Say, say that the project involves pelleting. Well, even with our pellet mill, you know, we wanted a larger size. We didn't want a bench top. We wanted a size that could be scaled up so the data we collect will mirror what industry would see on a larger pellet mill. You know, in cases like that, it almost takes a minimum of two to 500 pounds to actually get a good reading. Because keep in mind, it's gonna take 200 pounds just to bring that pellet dye up to temp to reach that steady state. And that's when you start collecting data, information, samples. And then um, one of the things we're discussing too is, um, you know, a lot of times when uh, new companies are developing a new product, you get to that state where they're ready to take it to test market the product, but they don't have the pr production facility yet. And one of the gaps that AURI can potentially fill is to do that. I, I don't like to use the term small scale production, but larger production runs for those test marketing efforts. And that's where we get into 1,000, 2,000 pounds of material. And I think, Al, uh, one thing that's impressed me in the, in the years I've been with AURI is that uh, the results that come out of the coal products lab typically can be easily scaled. And that is such a value to the, to the client. It is, and that's why, they, that's why they knock on our door. Like I said, on, and Riley, you can jump in if I'm missing something, but on any piece of equipment that we're working with in the pilot lab, granted, there are uh, benchtop pieces of equipment that can mimic that and give you a similar result, but it's in the scaling. So with that pellet mill, if we know that a seven to one compression die using 2% steam gave us a pellet that was 97% durability and what we were looking for. If our client has a 200 horse pellet mill, we know what changes need to be made when they wanna go and purchase a pellet die to scale it up so that they see the same results. Same with the dewatering press. A lot of those pieces of equipment, you can uh, scale up and uh, be able to predict how it's going to be perform pretty closely. Got a question here, uh, and it may be uh, back a question or two that uh, a goal that I asked, yeah. but it says, will that work for small runs of production for new products to be done in Wasika? Not nope. real sure. Dan, I know what they're getting at. I would say yes, you know, definitely reach out to us, give us a call. Um, you know, I talk about the 200 pounds to, you know, 2,000 pounds. But right now, we probably have three or four projects going on. Well, right now, we're, we're doing blends down to 50 pounds, looking at what is the, the, the nutrient characteristic. I'm, I'm talking kind of broadly because we can't <laughs> talk about specific projects. 
but we can start on a very small level. Um, and on a lot of the pieces of equipment that Riley highlighted, they can be all run yeah. with 50 pound samples, 20 pound samples, even the that's, decorticator. That's what I was going to add on those other pieces of equipment. With the decorticator, we're running, you know, somewhere around effectively 15, 20 pounds of incoming stock per hour mm -hmm. after we've run it through a couple of times to get a really nice clean sample. Uh, so that's kind of that scale. And then the dryer, like perfect. Just if we have, you know, a couple five gallon pails, you know, 30, 50 pounds of material is great to, for us to be able to get the data that we're looking for from that tool. Um, and then the oil press uh, that that runs somewhere around 40 to 50 pounds an hour. So if we get we can operate that on 15 or 20 pounds at a minimum to get some data and, and some minimum product from from that. So we can operate with smaller quantities on quite a few other pieces of equipment, but more so the pellet mill and the hammer mill, we need those larger batches just to feed it just because it's a larger system. Well, we have a wide variety of uh, people who have logged onto our webinar today, Al. Uh, I'll leave you with the uh, final word. What do you want them to know about AURI and its co-products lab? Well, thank you, Dan. And I just want to, you know, say thank you for everyone that has joined us today that took time out of their busy schedule. Even with everything going on, life is busy, and uh, I hope you found value in this presentation. It's always fun to go a little bit deeper, give you more explanation behind the equipment and the projects we do on that, but we're somewhat limited. We couldn't go that deep today. But if there's any way that AURI can assist you, focusing on adding value to an agricultural product, a commodity, or a process, boy, feel free to give us a call. You know, find us on the website or write down our, our phone number and reach out to us. So thank you, Dan. Very good. That concludes AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday for today. Thank you to Al and Riley for their time. AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday is presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. And we are interested in your feedback, so please respond when we send you our event evaluations. Remember, for more information on today's program or any of the work AURI is involved in, you can go to auri.org. Join us June 9th to hear from AURI team members in Marshall, Minnesota, as they highlight their various lab capabilities, which support bio-based, co-product, food, and renewable energy projects. This virtual event will showcase the chemistry labs, food development kitchen, and the new sensory evaluation center in Marshall. The audience will gain an awareness of how the Marshall labs and businesses in applied research and development through their wide range of capabilities and resources. And of course, you can always learn more about other work that AURI is involved with by going online to auri.org. See you June 9th for another AURI Connects webinar Wednesday.